Uh, good afternoon. For those of you who are joining us for only the afternoon session, I want to um, welcome you and say we're late in getting started because we had such a productive morning and such a great outpouring of ideas uh, in, in, in multiple papers. The reason I'm stalling dramatically, or obviously, is because we can't find Professor Kohlhoff. And, <laughs> you know, I've learned that it's harder to organize Germans than any other national group. Um, however, we're going to start, um, uh, and I will hope that he will appear. Um, uh, if not, um, well, the show must go on. He is in New Haven. We've seen him. Um, as recently <laughs> as recently as a few hours ago. Um, so tonight, the, the topic today, this afternoon, uh, the first of the two panels this afternoon, the topic for it is Building the Capital City, Missed Opportunities. Um, and it provides our three panelists, we hope, three, Hans Kohlhoff, Peter Eisenman, and Jorgen Mayaha, the opportunity to consider unfulfilled promises in Berlin's recent architectural development. Each of these architects has direct experience of Berlin, contributing to the discussion of what might have been, and um, uh, what should have been, and what might have been. In what Pro Professor Forster described in his Thursday evening keynote as a tentative capital. Professor Hans Koloff studied architecture at the University of Karlsruhe with Egon Ehrman, as well as at the Vienna University of Technology in Austria. Professor Koloff taught at Cornell University as an assistant to Oswald Matthias Ungers. Ungers is one of the key links, it would appear, um, it, it is certainly the case, in discussing recent and contemporary issues in, Ber in Berlin. And, he, uh, and after uh, assisting Ungers, um, uh, Professor Kohlhoff later uh, 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 taught at the Technical University of Berlin. Since 1990, he's been professor of architecture at the ETH in Zurich. Um, and in 1984, with Helga Timmermann, he embarked upon private practice, realizing some of Euro Germany's most widely discussed and prominent buildings. He is now in the auditorium. I am feeling much better. <laughs> um, with Timmerman, he embarked upon private practice, realizing some of Germany's most widely discussed and prominent buildings at key Berlin locations, such as Unter den Linden and Friedrichstrasse, as well as the skyscraper at Potsdamer Platz um, uh, uh, and the conversion of the firmer, former Berliner Reichsbank to the new use and new purpose as the foreign office of the new Berlin Republic. Professor Koloff's quintessentially refined architecture stands apart from the contemporary scene because of its attention to detail and its respect for the traditions of German architecture and urbanism, especially those of the shamefully neglected expressionist work of the interwar years. Peter Eisenman is Charles Gwathmi Professor in Practice here at Yale. Professor Eisenman is an internationally recognized architect and educator whose work includes two significant buildings in Berlin, the house at Checkpoint Charlie, which uh, you heard about from Professor Forster the other night, and a highly acclaimed memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. Though unrealized, as Professor Forster made clear in his lecture, Professor Eisenman's Max Reinhardt Tower has had a tremendous impact on contemporary production. Professor Eisenman holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell, the Master of Science in Architecture from Columbia, and the MA and PhD degrees from Cambridge University. Prior to establishing a full-time architectural practice in 1980, Mr. Eisenman worked as an independent architect, educator, and theorist. In 1967, he founded the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, um, uh, an international think tank for architecture in New York, um, where he served as director until 1982, and where, I believe I'm correct in saying, Rem Kulhas spent a year, uh, during which time he worked feverishly on his book, Delirious New York. 
Jürgen Meyer Ha is a leader of the new generation of German architects, founder in 1996 and principal of the Berlin-based cross-disciplinary studio that bears his name. Professor Meyer Ha uh, uh, studied architecture at Stuttgart University from which he graduated in 1992. He received the Master of Architecture in 1994 from Princeton University. His work has been published and exhibited worldwide as part of a um, numerous collections, including those of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the SF MoMA. Jürgen Meyer Ha has taught in the US at Princeton, Harvard, and Columbia, and in Berlin at the University of the Arts and, and the Kunsthochschule uh, um, uh, as well. Um, serving as respondent to this afternoon's session is Rem Kulhas, who joins us through the magic of the internet by way of Doha, where it's in the middle of the night. So these talks better be lively until we can keep our moderator attentive and awake. He's on the screen right now. Rem Kulhas first came to public and critical attention with OMA, o OMA, the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, uh, um, the office he founded in 1975, together with architects Ilya Zengelis, Zoe Zengelis, and Madeleine Wiesendorp. And they founded that in London. While many consider New York, in a, in a way, to be the foundation stone for the uh, OMR uh, edifice, um, given the importance of the book Delirious New York to establishing um, uh, the Cool House position, the architectural historian Fritz Neumeyer has pointed out that OMA's place of origin uh, was not New York, but Berlin, from where the path led to, um, as Neumeyer Riley puts it, quote, less spectacular, but similarly delirious, um, uh, 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 created a journey that was less spectacular, but similarly delirious. Locating Berlin um, uh, as the centerpiece, or uh, the foundation stone of the OMA practice, um, and the uh, ideas that lie behind it um, is particularly appropriate for our uh, uh, proceedings today. Among OMA's most many notable and recognized projects, I want to draw uh, your attention to but one, the Dutch Embassy in Berlin, which won the Architectur Prize in Berlin in 2003, and um, the Mies van der Rohe Award for European Architecture in 2005. Rem, we welcome you from Yale. Um, and we'll hear more from you later. Uh, but now I turn the platform over to Professor Kohlhoff. Thanks for your patience. Hello, Rem. Um, <laughs> I think the city doesn't have to be invented again. And uh, because the concept of the city has proven in history to be flexible without limits. And uh, secondly, I believe the city is made up of houses, houses in the German sense. Uh, it's not just residential, but it's units of buildings. I think you have to look closely what is there when you're working in a city. That's what I learned, among other things, from uh, Matthias Ungers. And you need a morphological capacity to translate it into a new project. Above all, you need a sense for where people of different taste wealth, origin, and so on, feel at home, because that is what the city is all about. And finally, people want to be proud of their city and want to hand it over to future generations. Um, and in order to accomplish that, that it doesn't have to be just beautiful, but also durable. This principle not just functions in Europe, it functions in America, and it uh,
functions also again in the slums of South America and uh, Asia. The principle is basically private land ownership, parcellation, public-private space, architectural treatment, which is rooted in the citizens' self-recognition of their heritage and of their future aspirations. The concept of social housing, as it has been practiced in East and West Germany, is destructive to this idea of the city. That's why during the EBA years it had been transformed and uh, translated closer to urban principles. Now, I have a quick view of this experience since I've been working in Berlin, Potsdamer Platz. We have seen this picture before from the Wenders film, Where is the Potsdamer Platz? And there were, for me and others of my generation, in West Berlin, um, very strong impacts of those images of Potsdamer Platz in our early work. Uh, that was the time when the periphery was somehow an ideal of the future city. And uh, we have seen a lot of uh, destruction photos, pictures. Um, but there were, in the late 60s, early 70s, there were artists coming up with uh, images like this one, a painting by Hödicke, who suddenly uh, gave you an idea that this is not just war destruction, uh, what you are living in, in such an area at Potsdamer Platz. Uh, it, it gives you a sense of uh, width, a sense of uh, looking to the horizon, and uh, he describes moments of uh, uh, beauty, uh, looking at Potsdamer Platz um, uh, when the sun uh, goes down. And uh, uh, so in that time, you felt that uh, uh, these, these images have an incredible uh, uh, provocation of going on and uh, turning it into a positive uh, experience. Um, we also have seen some of these first uh, projects here again in the picture we have not seen yet. Um, the uh, uh, collective plan uh, under Sharoon uh, with the, this incredible um, building from Leipziger Platz all the way to the east, which was uh, really um, inter interpreted as a building. Here the city before the destruction in red, uh, the uh, plan by Speer. And uh, uh, the perspective of the collective plan. Um, you, you see the octagon on the left-hand side. That is uh, Leipziger Platz. And there's a gigantic structure going all over uh, to the east to Kreuzberg. And uh, the Smitsons, with the two levels of car traffic and pedestrian traffic, um, the configuration of Leipziger Platz has uh, disappeared like others. Le Corbusier, a faint yeah, yeah okay, thanks. A, a faint uh, rest of uh, 
the octagon is still visible. And uh, our first um, contribution to the question, how are you going to be, uh, going, are you going about uh, after the wall has gone uh, with this area? This was in 91 or 92, uh, I believe. Uh, we started working with a computer. This is uh, what you were able to do at that time. The white line you see back there uh, is the horizon. It was incredibly difficult at that time to fill up that gap to the horizon. <laughs> and the, and the, um, uh, the idea, of course, as you see here, uh, was completing uh, the block structure along Leipziger Straße, completing the configuration of the octagon. Uh, you have seen several uh, pictures uh, uh, these days uh, with the octagon as a street configuration in this desert uh, uh, along the wall. So rebuilding that space uh, with uh, the volume um, it had originally. But then we interpreted the, um, the, the former border where the wall has been, which at the same time was the border uh, of uh, Berlin before the city went uh, uh, to the west with an extrusion. Uh, we accepted that border and said, in that green, there is a cluster of high-rise uh, buildings. At Alexanderplatz on the other end of Leipziger Straße, uh, a similar project with the only, uh, and that was a competition much later, um, with the uh, main idea keeping the buildings by Peter Behrens, uh, also keeping more or less uh, that edge of the uh, department store and uh, defining the square the first time in history as a real square, not just as a, a traffic intersection, um, uh, in a scale where people would uh, uh, want uh, to be. It still would be still a large square with the blocks in the normal height and behind in a second row these high rises. The perspective from inside the square. And then uh, going back to that uh, time um, when we started our practice in West Berlin, th that was right after uh, the archipelago project and you have seen some of these uh, volumes of these Brandwandhäuser, firewall uh, buildings. We were entirely intrigued by these uh, volumes, completely uh, closed, heavy uh, solids without windows, because it's, uh, they were previously integrated into the block system. The facade is on the other side. The facade didn't interest us at all. But uh, we related this, and uh, Fritz, Neum Fritz Neumeyer was mentioned. He, uh, uh, at that time, worked uh, on Gilly, Friedrich Gilly, and he, uh, Gilly, Gilly did this uh, drawing, this perspective, with these volumes in the landscape. This was, was our uh, imagination to start with, thinking about the future of uh, Berlin. And uh, of course, that was close to uh, Schinkel's um, experience in England, where he spoke about those uh, volumes uh, um, in, in, a, in, a certain, in, a, in a certain way of fascination and despair uh, at the same time. Uh, look at these uh, uh, gigantic volumes without any architecture, but you feel that he was very enthusiastic uh, about this uh, scale and the solidity. 
one of the early projects after uh, 89 we built in Leipzig. Actually, it was a, it, this, this structure was already there. Uh, it was supposed to be an exhibition building uh, on this uh, fair uh, site uh, in Leipzig, which we slightly transformed and uh, put a facade on, his, on it the first time with this um, tectonic uh, relief, uh, of course, in stone. And uh, why stone? Uh, our Iba buildings uh, used brick and stucco, brick in order to go with the construction into the ground, because with stucco at that time, uh, that stucco meant insulation, as you see it here, and uh, 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 on top of it, uh, plaster. Uh, this construction would not go into the ground, so you would need uh, some metal or something there. And uh, for us, if you look at, at the picture of uh, Gilly, uh, the volume has to uh, 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 pr uh, project out of the ground, be part of the earth rather than floating uh, over it. So you needed some other material. You needed brick or you needed stone. And uh, stone was uh, constructed in this way at that time, very cheap, very, very poor. Uh, and so uh, we had to invent something else. Uh, this type of construction was taking the volume of the building, putting a square grid on it, and screwing the stone pieces uh, to the wall. So uh, what we did, uh, we took these stone slabs of three or four centimeter thickness and superimposed them uh, in rectangles, of course, horizontally, vertically, and of course, uh, you get a beam and you get a pilaster and you are with Alberti and in the end, you are able to make a column. This was one of the first projects done in this fashion, Friedrichstraße. Um, uh, I had a long discussion with Hans Stimmann about this. What is missing here is a building which was preserved, but not because it was under historic preservation, because Stimmann said this block is, uh, in, is um, uh, cut into parcels, uh, the principle of parcellation, and we want to keep it here in the middle of the city. That's why we want to have uh, we, uh, we, we want to keep this building. Uh, our client, Heinz, uh, was uh, uh, getting uh, 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 furious, but we had to keep the building. In the end, we had to tear it down, but rebuild it again uh, uh, the same way it was uh, before. Here, this uh, principle I was talking about, the block with the streets, uh, individual lots, private lots, and uh, the architecture. Um, and uh, when you uh, throw a bomb into such an area, you get a very beautiful uh, uh, Brandwende facades. Uh, in, that, uh, in the corner especially by, because they are not rectangular anymore. So uh, here, the reconstructed old building. We found in that facade uh, cast iron <coughs> columns which we integrated again. And uh, um, th th this was the first time we had the experience of the traditional uh, architecture of the 19th century, how that relates uh, to this relief uh, of the uh, uh, tectonic facade. And uh, this is what you learn uh, from New York. Um, you have seen the, these buildings have uh, different heights. It goes up and down. There was a long discussion with uh, Stimmann about the so-called Traufhöhe in Berlin. I think the Traufhöhe is not that much important uh, because you see it here. Important is how the buildings uh, perform 
on the ground level along the, along the street, uh, ground level first floor, and then as they go higher than normal in, in the silhouette of the city. And uh, these, these streets in, in New York and Chicago, uh, they started from very low uh, buildings, or rather low buildings here, five stories. Uh, sometimes you see even three-story buildings next to a skyscraper. It works perfectly well. It has to work on uh, the street level. Um, uh, recently, we finished a project like that. It was a, a large lot um, uh, in uh, Cologne. Um, uh, we won this uh, competition with a kind of artificial parcellation. We cut the program into five buildings. Uh, we had to uh, uh, refurbish this existing building with the same principle. We just went uh, a step further here. Uh, it's not just slabs anymore. Uh, the relief uh, is a little bit more uh, um, complex. And uh, of course, um, uh, you can do this then with the, not just with the superimposition, but uh, you make profiles. And as soon as you have the curved profile, the rounded profile, also here, um, the volume is tied together even more, more than just by the superimposition of the, of the slab. And uh, uh, this is what, of course, what you, what you uh, find so uh, fascinating with uh, buildings from the Renaissance on until the early 20th century. Here, the street and uh, uh, the base. And uh, it's important in order to take a building seriously that it has a base and the base goes into the ground. There doesn't have to be a joint here. And of that kind is this view at the uh, Potsdamer Platz. This is our building for the Delbrück Bank. There, our building for Mercedes-Benz, uh, next to a building by Christoph Sattler. A very short uh, portion of a street where before was a desert. It's possible to build on, on uh, this flat land where there is nothing. It's possible today to build a street. Uh, uh, this is what this picture to, to me proves. This is the uh, location of this uh, building. This, the little street is this. It doesn't go further here. That is disappointing, but here you have this idea of a city made up of high rises. Um, yeah, um, this building has a strange configuration, especially uh, how the uh, uh, tower and the block are shifted uh, uh, above each other. It's because uh, underneath the building is the railway uh, track, and the tower had to be um, or had to be uh, parallel. Uh, to the railroad track, built across the railroad track, it was not possible uh, to have an alternative uh, um, foundation. Uh, but at the same time, the, the block was given by the urban plan. So this is why block and tower slab are in a strange configuration. But uh, for us, that was exciting, of course, because we we, we liked to um, uh, work sculpturally with the volume, but not intentionally making an interesting figure. Uh, it, it, it sort of appeared uh, from inside. And in order to make this building, which is not that high, it's uh, 90 meters or so, um, uh, uh, to make it more slim, we made this little uh, step 
in the front, which gives the building a vertical thrust. The entrance, here again, a nice profile around the entry. And of course, without the experience of the American high rises, this would not be possible. Either this would be possible. Uh, and uh, uh, people who worked there and people who rented these spaces, they recognized it because it's, it's full with uh, uh, lawyers' firms uh, uh, who work internationally, who can pay this rent. Uh, and it's the same with uh, the Mercedes Tower on the other side. And uh, here I mentioned this triangular piece um, of, a, of a triangular uh, a block. These, uh, these, these sculptures, no facades, that was, that was initially what we are interested in. And uh, I want to clarify this again with one other example, our project at the KNSM Island uh, in uh, Amsterdam. And the Dutch experience at that time was also very uh, influential uh, for us. Um, this project was very successful and was uh, copied a uh, hundred times. <laughs> Everybody thought, yeah, this is a, a, a new kind of uh, uh, expressionism. Uh, we had nothing like that uh, in our mind. Uh, what happened was this. We took a block that was given to us by the urban plan, was even more complicated, and we sort of stepped on it. Uh, we stepped in on it because um, this was the first configuration. And uh, you don't know, uh, are these three courtyards or is that a public space and the courtyard? We opened it because that didn't make sense to make a public space. So it's, it's a passage through the block, two courtyards, then we had to respect this existing building because people wanted to stay here. So we had to open up this. And uh, so uh, with this morphological transformation, we ended up here. In, in the end, we, we pushed down the part towards the south and towards the nice view on the water. Uh, in the back, we have nine floors or 10 floors. And in the front, we have only three floors. This is how it happened. And now if you go to Hamburg, Hafen City, everywhere you have that, you have these shapes, but they, these buildings don't even have roofs. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, Potsdamer Platz, uh, the Daimler building. And of course, without you, Ferris, uh, and uh, without Rem bringing up this uh, example of you, Ferris, uh, probably we wouldn't have been able to make that building. But it's very similar to those Brand wall, uh, Brand, uh, uh, wall buildings. And uh, uh, this, the, the sculptural quality of those was uh, similarly uh, influential to the project. And at that time, we had already developed uh, the relief, which uh, is on the lower floors horizontal. Then it's more or less balanced. And of course, on the top, where you have to define the crown and where you have to make a skyscraper, uh, which uh, talks more to the sky than to the ground, as Cesar, Cesar Pelli said. Uh, you, you have to, the, the verticals take over. It's all made from uh, prefab elements. And of course, you have, the, the, the task is to make the joints disappear. You don't see the joints because they are hidden on the side. And uh, I, I was sitting uh, several days once uh, in the Interconti, which is where the photograph has been made. And looking at this 
miracle when the sun uh, comes up in the morning until it goes down in the evening, how this situation in Chicago is transformed. It's simply breathtaking. And here, how this skyscraper type after the fire in Chicago uh, developed from six stories, seven stories, it goes up. It's parcellation. The ground level is important. And then at a certain point, it becomes important what happens at the corners. And uh, like the Bauer Academy of Schinkel, and he probably was rather influential for the Chicago architecture of the, after the Grand uh, uh, Fire. Uh, yeah, here already, because he uh, didn't think about uh, high rises, but he was experienced in building uh, Gothic uh, architecture. He, uh, for him, there was no contradiction between Gothic tectonic and classical tectonic. That's why it was easy for him to let the pilasters uh, push through the corners. And uh, this is one of his paintings. So fascination of the Gothic. Uh, I have not been here in Yale uh, since 20 years. Uh, and uh, now for me, the Gothic, or the Gothic that has built not even 100 years ago, 80 years, 70 years ago, in the 30s, 70, 80 years ago. Yeah? Uh, it's absolutely uh, astonishing. And uh, of course, with the, cla with the classical uh, principle, uh, you end up with the, laws, with, with the laws column. So you have to do this step. And uh, the European architects who made high rises didn't do that step. Why didn't they do this step? Because uh, the, uh, the Gothic uh, tectonic to them was not, uh, uh, did not lend itself uh, for practical translation because they somehow were reluctant to take the uh, church image and turn it into uh, a uh, uh, normal uh, 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 building, office building. Uh, here the Tower of the Woolworth building and uh, the uh, Tower of the Cathedral in Strasbourg. And that's why there are no, no real skyscrapers in Europe. You know, they were completely blocked. Now, um, for what you have seen here and for, uh, for my uh, education as an architect, there were several um, experiences important uh, from the Cornell time. One of them was uh, John W. Reps. Uh, making of urban America. Because for Europeans, uh, the cities, the old cities, Berlin is, a rather, is an exception, is a very young city. But uh, the old cities, they go back. Uh, you cannot trace it uh, back to the, to the first, to the first uh, step. The American cities, you go uh, not even 200 years back, and there is somebody who comes across with his family and makes a makes a building, and this is the beginning of uh, making a city. So that gave me a completely new idea of what a city is. And here you have the uh, New Haven plan uh, with the uh, green. And uh, it took, I think it took 200 years somehow to, uh, to really define this square. But uh, the, the settlers came over and said, we keep this. 300 by 300 meters or something, we keep it open for public function, for public representation. And uh, take uh, Savannah, Georgia, until, until the middle of the last century, uh, they uh, extended the city according to this grid. And sometimes it just uh, didn't succeed. 
another influence uh, was certainly Colin Rowe and his uh, Collar City. And uh, um, just as an example for this uh, influence, the Hague uh, competition we won uh, for the ministries uh, of uh, justice and uh, interior. Uh, here a project by uh, uh, Leon Krier's brother. And uh, yeah, something uh, which is like a Colin Rowe configuration. For us, it was important uh, since these towers uh, became rather big, even though they are 160 meters or so high. Um, and uh, to, uh, the, here is the, the government and the, the historic uh, center. Uh, and uh, the view from there uh, was the major aspect of uh, uh, cutting the towers into uh, two elements with steep angles to let them appear more elegantly. And here again, the, the Dutch single houses, six story, seven story, and then it can, can go higher. There is no limit. Yeah, it, and the, the decision of the Hague government in that small old city uh, uh, making the seat for the ministries um, that uh, for us is possible only if we take the uh, structure of the city, the volume uh, of the city, and from there project the towers uh, into the sky. One tower in uh, uh, almost white uh, granite and the other in, in uh, red brick. Uh, here you see quite nicely the, uh, the scale of these small houses and it, how it relates in material, but also in the tectonic uh, quality uh, to the historic buildings. And. Uh, also, this book was important uh, for us. But uh, uh, as intriguing as these pictures were, uh, our, and our building at Potsdamer Platz has, even has a certain similarity to this building on a triangular uh, floor uh, plan, uh, it, rather than projecting an idea into the city, we try to let this idea uh, being, being born, so to, uh, so to say, from, from inside the conditions of the site, the program, the client, and so on. And it's a completely different approach than uh, this one. Uh, uh, it, it's not uh, the attempt to make inventions and uh, insert them into the city, but rather let uh, the building be itself uh, out of the conditions which you find. So uh, it's different from um, uh, the mass production, which needs to be designed in a fashion uh, that uh, is intriguing for the consumer. And uh, here I um, uh, have to make some comments to our uh, current uh, situation as architects and uh, urban uh, designers. Um, I feel that uh, we are together uh, walking into a crisis of mass production and at the same time uh, of our uh, democracy, which became or is becoming these days one and the same thing. It's exchangeable, our type of uh, democracy and our uh, kind of consumerism. And uh, I believe there are simply things which uh, are not a question of uh, consumption. And uh, um, 
there was one person uh, who uh, probably can give us an idea of what is happening there and where we stand, uh, who visited the States um, almost 200 years ago. Uh, his name was uh, Tocqueville. And uh, he came to America in 1831. And uh, uh, when he arrived in New York at the uh, east uh, and passed by the East River, uh, he was totally fascinated by uh, those white temples they were, uh, he recognized here, a whole number of white uh, temples. And uh, uh, the, uh, the next day, he um, uh, came there and, and, and found out that these temples were not made uh, in marble, uh, but in wood. And they were not temples, they were simple houses. And he was incredibly disappointed uh, because they were, were made in wood. And uh, uh, for us, that, that is not a problem because we know that you can uh, uh, exchange wood for stone and back again. Um, but uh, he, his reflection goes further. And uh, he says, in aristocratic societies, each artisan should produce the best possible uh, product and the best possible uh, workmanship. And uh, um, in this new democratic society he saw coming up, um, since there were no, no uh, 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 professional um, entities anymore, everybody could open uh, his uh, shop, uh, he said uh, um, everybody is gaining the greatest possible quantity of money at the last possible cost. This would be the uh, principle of this uh, democracy, democracy um, which he saw coming up in America. Um, and uh, the will of the customer, he said, is then the only limit. Uh, but the customer turned into the consumer and also changed. Um, and the, this consumer did not have um, any sense anymore uh, about what is well made and long lasting or not. And uh, he said in, 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 this, in this time, in the early times, uh, the even uh, simple uh, people would prefer rather to refrain from buying an uh, object of uh, imperfection. Um, the craftsmen work um, in arist aristocracies only for a limited number, three, three minutes, only for a limited number uh, of uh, customers uh, who are rather fastidious. Uh, the profit they hope to make depends principally on the perfection of the workmanship. Such is no longer the case when all privileges being abolished, says Tocqueville. Ranks are intermingled and men are forever rising uh, uh, and, uh, and men are and since men are in this society rising and uh, sinking upon the ladder of society, in democracies there are always a multitude of individuals uh, whose wants are above their means and who are very willing to take up with imperfect satisfaction rather than abandon the object of their desires. The workman then strives to invent methods which may enable him not only to work better, but quicker and cheaper. Or, if he cannot succeed in that, 
to diminish the intrinsic qualities of the thing he makes. And uh, in the end, they would strive to give to all their commodities attractive qualities which they do not in reality possess. Today, I think we would call this design. Design is what you can do if you can't do things well, says the German philosopher Sloterdijk. Thank you very much. I think I've made a terrible mistake <laughs> because while I think the title Missed Opportunities is slightly self-congratulatory, I first have to applaud Hans Kohlhoff for not falling victim uh, to such a title, uh, as you will see I have. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my missed opportunities um, in Berlin. I also feel that I made a mistake because uh, hearing the last presentation this morning, uh, I believe that it would have been far better to have been in uh, this panel, Missed Opportunities, uh, although you all can say, well, it's not 2020 yet, from what I saw this morning, uh, I believe it would qualify for this panel. Uh, and uh, having been uh, concerned about being in the last EBA, I want to suggest that uh, uh, Vittorio Lampagnani, who is one of my guides through that time, uh, all my complaints about that, all of my complaints about earlier talks, Mr. Creer, et cetera, uh, go out the window uh, when I see what's going to happen 2020 in Berlin. Probably some of us will still not be around, uh, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, um, I um, want to begin my talk by arriving in London in 1960, and there was a prohibition uh, at that time for building uh, tall buildings. And uh, I thought, what a quaint idea that was at the time. Uh, I thought London was a fabulous city. I now go back to London where there literally tower upon tower uh, done by some of the world's best architects uh, I think including our own Ram Kulhas. And I think that was a good idea uh, because uh, I think, you know, you can't keep things the way they were. And so I'm going to show you two towers that when I first proposed them in the 1990s in Berlin, there was a bit of a prohibition uh, about uh, tall buildings. Um, it might have been the nature of my tall buildings, and I'm perfectly prepared to believe that, uh, but uh, again, um, I will leave that for other commentators uh, to digress upon. Um, I have participated in five unrealized projects in Berlin, more than any other city in the world uh, where I have been working. So uh, there I, I have a very fondness for Berlin because I really like unrealized projects. I'm better off with unrealized projects, uh, perhaps, than realized ones. Um, in any case, to keep the thing short, because I made a short talk uh, um, knowing that uh, we would be 
short of time, uh, uh, I will proceed. The first project uh, that I'm going to speak about is the Max Reinhardt House, um, which was uh, projected in 1992. It was a project that was commissioned by the Reinhardt family on the site of their, the former uh, uh, famous uh, Schauspielhaus by uh, for Reinhardt's theater uh, by, I believe it was Pulsig, but I could be wrong, uh, was right. Yeah, I, I keep thinking, is it, is it Max Taut, is it? But it's, it was Pulsig. In any case, um, it was a site that was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, not on a major street, set back, etc. And the Reinhardts wanted to have a foundation and a, and a multi-use building uh, which a developer was willing uh, at the time to uh, finance. And um, there is the uh, site plan um, and the model. Let's see, so I don't point this at anybody wrongly. Uh, the Spray River, the, uh, the Bahnhof uh, here, uh, and uh, we are, that's the Friedrichstrasse bridge, and here is where the old Polzig Theater was, and there was the tower. What we were doing at the time, um, it's not quite, not too tall, by the way. Uh, we were doing something, it was one of the first projects that dealt with um, what was very important in 1992, uh, the ideas of gender specificity, and uh, it was an attempt to suggest that a tower could be non-phalagocentric, uh, which is a word that uh, was very important at the time. Half of this audience will not know what that word means, and it's not important, uh, but uh, phalagocentrism was a real hot issue, right? And uh, so, Maybe uh, the, the, the idea was uh, to see if we could build a tower that had no inside, no outside, um, but was what we knew at the time was a Möbius strip. Um, all of these drawings, uh, in, in, in one sense, are pre uh, the fabulous algorithms that we have today for generating such things. We had a platform called Form Z, which only could facet, uh, and instead of giving you figures, it could give you planes. And uh, the reason why this is a planar uh, shape is because um, that was the only thing we could use. Um, there were actually plans worked out for this tower, uh, part of it being the, the uh, Reinhardt uh, uh, Stiftung and part of it was uh, rental properties and part of it a hotel. So it was a, a multi-use uh, project. Um, and uh, there you can see the, the section, uh, the computer generated um, uh, model and uh, the actual project itself, um, which importantly went down into the ground, in other words, completed itself uh, underground. Um, there you can see these faceted shapes in, that uh, the computer gave us, but it was an idea that what was inside could be outside and vice versa. In other words, it, it uh, twisted through itself, so in a continuous loop, so there was both both outside and inside were one and the same thing. Um, another series of uh, models. Um, did it fit into its surroundings? No. <laughs> uh, was it intended to? No. Uh, it was supposed to be an icon to the Reinhardt memory, etc., and had that quality 
of the theater that Reinhardt uh, uh, was so important in developing in Berlin. And here is a model later made for an exhibition uh, in, at the MoMA uh, where you can see the complete uh, version in a um, glass uh, plastic enclosed ground uh, showing the, the, the project. We then, um, and for whatever reasons, um, we didn't build that project. Uh, the Reinhardt family is still after me, uh, wanting to build it. Um, I was hoping for a groundswell of excitement uh, from this audience and we'd sign a petition, Occupy Wall Street, and uh, they're, they're talking about building it on Governor's Island. I'm certain that that's not where it should be. Um, uh, in any case, another developer came along and said, we have another site that you would be interested in, the site of Mises' uh, 1922 glass uh, skyscraper, the Spree Dreieck site, and um, we'd like you to um, try a tower. Uh, this uh, tower was one of the first uh, that uh, very smooth uh, and the, clearly the computer programs by 98 and 99 had changed uh, so that we had a much more control over uh, the, the kind of project that we wanted. It's one of uh, the really uh, sleek uh, versions of, that you begin to see now uh, popping up all over the world. Uh, this was in 1998, much before most of them began. It, it was a, an amalgam from uh, the two towers that Mies did. There were two versions of the tower, um, the one on the left and the one on the right, clearly uh, of different uh, vintages, but uh, similar ideas. What we did was to take uh, the Mies, uh, the, the, the triangular Mies Tower, uh, which was here, and all our computer could do at the time uh, was to um, morph it. And we morphed from here, and morphing was part of what computer processes do now without even telling you, uh, to produce uh, this project here. And here was the uh, typical floor plan. Um, and um, we figured out with the developer and the engineers that uh, we would be adding 20% to the cost of the skin only, which was 15% of the building. So we were adding a fraction of the cost uh, of the project. Um, I find uh, the, the picture here uh, quite engaging um, when we think of some of the recent uh, downtown uh, skyscrapers. Uh, that uh, follow uh, similar lines. Um, again, um, we were uh, asked to uh, move some other place. Uh, I, I, I don't call it a missed opportunity, mind you, but uh, there you are. So um, those are the uh, two projects that uh, I wanted to show. Um, they, I will not show the five other unrealized projects because uh, I want to give time uh, to our guests uh, so that we uh, are able to hear everybody. Thank you very much. I'm here today, I think, because of two things also. I took literature classes with Peter Eisenman at Cooper Union on post-structuralist literature. And I won a competition where Hans Koloff was the jury president in 
um, but only because he had to leave the last day when the jury making was done, I guess. So um, this is a good point to start this presentation, which um, gives a little bit of a private history to somebody who came to Berlin in 94, um, not being involved really in the moment when the wall fell and uh, not really involved in these early discussions on how Berlin should be like and what is the vision for the city. I came in 94 in a moment where there was an intense dynamic transformation, um, mostly in the arts, in music, in theater, in literature. It didn't really happen in architecture, which was more a discussion or discourse fueled by a sentiment of loss rather than a curiosity of the new or for the new. There was a vision, as we experienced in my generation, uh, a vision of uniformity um, versus trying to understand what the multiplicity can be of a contemporary society, where are the unique potentials of Berlin to rebuild a contemporary city based on its complex pasts. But it also gave us the great opportunity to look at the world outside, to work outside of Berlin with that experience, with these discussions we experienced in the city, to see the potentials of Berlin maybe applied somewhere else. So Berlin became the hotbed of um, a cultural reference for the work in our office. It became somehow um, an understanding of an architecture as a catalyst, as an activator. And we used architecture as a writing. But which story, uh, story to tell? The primordial soup for our work came kind of uh, by chance. It's a letter soup that I want to call data protection pattern. And these patterns I found in around 1994 when I moved to Berlin. They were invented and produced maybe in the late 19th century, but around 1913, 100 years ago. Um, basically, a very crucial year, as also Florian Illis just describes and documents in his book 1913, which is the bestseller in Germany right now, um, became also uh, crucial because the largest fund developer and print developer for letter sets and um, types uh, and funds was based in Berlin. It is a company called Berthold, which went bankrupt in the 80s, um, placed in Meringdam in Berlin. And they were crucial for what we know today as writing and printing and media, basically, one of the very early developers of media um, production. What we have uh, here with the data protection patterns is a strategic tool, a contemporary ornament um, that deals very clearly with ideas of privacy or private information and public exposure. It comes when you get PIN numbers from your bank or your salary slips. It protects the personal information from a kind of uh, non-controlled view. And these patterns somehow became a prototype for our work as a metaphor how we deal in a culture of data obsessed, um, obsessed economy. It is something where we can learn about how issues of inside and outside, private and public, um, discrete, indiscreet, hidden, exposed, are constantly negotiated along this fine membrane um, that also can be seen as a kind of a prototype or metaphor for architecture. It is a tool to reflect that spatial implications that we now, as architects, have to think about um, how architecture is produced in a culture that deals with these issues. So we take these patterns as a starting point to explore what are um, the spaces we want to deal with. They are samples um, that show the kind of the, trans the, the transformation from a two-dimensional strategic element to a spatial entity, from small scale, two dimensions, to three dimensional and urban scale. And I'm showing you here some of the examples, um, the patterns that I collected in the last 20 years. You see them as numbers, as letters. This is the Berthold AG in Meringdam, um, where basically all these types were produced. And in the catalog from 1913, they offered these lead stamps with the patterns already. So this is what you see, and this is actually the letters here, this letter soup, this primordial soup, um, that is kind of the background um, for our work. And here are the examples of envelopes that you get every day in your mail. It's somehow 
maybe the last visible system of control of these issues of private and public or personal and um, uh, available to everybody, where once you understand what the technologies and the strategics um, are, you can also understand how they happen now in a digital, virtual, invisible world um, around us. These are examples where you see the numbers and letters, and it comes as you know points, um, more effects, camouflage patterns. Um, you'll see them every day in your mail, as I said before. They come as logos. Um, it's a whole universe, a graphic universe, that uh, helps us to understand and explore um, our spatial ideas. I'm showing now step by step how we translate these patterns into a larger kind of spatial idea where it becomes human scale, where we can inhabit them, where we start to get, get immersed, into, immersed into these patterns. Uh, this is an installation we did in Berlin at the Berlinische Galerie. It's a carpet installation where it wraps and envelopes the building um, and gives you somehow a first one-to-one -one relationship. They become also step-by-step -step three-dimensionalized and the cubes that you see here um, on the pedestals are maybe the most kind of uh, explicit translation of these patterns from 2D to 3D. When you see on the upper left a pattern as it is printed two-dimensionally, you can read the five and the seven and the nine and so forth. As soon as you turn around, it becomes a spatial, complicated labyrinth and complexity. There's a three-dimensional interpretation of these patterns into a different form of spatial experience, and step by step I'm showing examples how that translates into a larger um, architecture. This is for the Autostadt in Wolfsburg, an exhibition design, or a dining hall in Karlsruhe, um, which was built earlier, where you also see this kind of structure of the skeletons becoming the space-defining elements. Or even larger, a courthouse we are finishing right now, it should be opened in April, in Hasselt in Belgium on the new uh, side along the train tracks. Or the relief idea um, and the perforations of facades in this uh, office building in Hamburg. Issues of trigger and ground also here in a villa near Ludwigsburg in uh, southern Germany. And one building we built so far in Berlin, which is this housing on Johannesstraße facing the uh, Tacheles area in the center of Berlin. Here you see a glass building because it's a very narrow street at some point um, where issues of privacy and intimacy was crucial in our understanding. This is the site. It's a front house and a side wing, a very typical layout um, of a Berlin building. And we wanted to take the green quality of the courtyards into the building, stepping up uh, the green and the, uh, in, on terraces um, all the way up um, into the top floors. And you see it also in the section as this landscape, um, understanding landscape living that we might have taken over from the 70s back into a building of today. But it's the floor plan that indicated or guided us to the facade, where you see here um, the front house looking into the apartments of the side wing. And of course, there needed to be some areas where you create privacy um, and, of course, also openness. So this map of degrees of discretion, as we call them, gave us an understanding how certain ideas of privacy can be created in a building, which is mostly a glass building, to get a lot of light into it. This is the view from the front house along the side wing. Um, at some point, it swapped over also to the front facade because we kind of liked the facades a lot. And it also would make sense on the street facade because it's a very narrow street where there's a lot of kind of close um, adjacency from the other buildings as well. Some close-ups of this facade. Um, this is the entrance that guides you and it's kind of this curtain, uh, kind of a new curtain wall uh, that seduces uh, you to enter the building. And this is, again, a view from the backyard and the main facade. This we translate now into a larger project. It's a high rise in Düsseldorf, which has won um, half a year ago. And we are now in the design development phase. And another high rise for Düsseldorf, um, it somehow became a, si uh, a, a city that likes us. Um, this is a town, uh, a a town center uh, complex 
with a 100 meter high rise, um, hopefully starting in about two years, it's still going through the zoning phase. Ideas of transformation are important with our architecture and that helps us to reflect and look back at the context where we work in. And maybe what we learned from Berlin is that if there is a situation that came from a very kind of precise regime and there's a shift of paradigm, um, then it also needs to be an architecture that kind of guides a vision for the future. We were invited by the Georgian government to be part of a translation or a transformation of an earlier regime towards a new contemporary country. And all the dots that you see are buildings we are involved with. So maybe actually Georgia is the largest project we work on right now. Um, I want to show you some of these kind of acupunctural um, interventions into the country that all are, um, let's say, key points, infrastructural key points, um, where you, would, you might experience the city or the country for the first time, or actually when you transit through the country, that's what you uh, might see. Maybe it's the only thing that you see in terms of architecture. We built a checkpoint, it's a border station between Georgia and Turkey on the Black Sea coast, which you see here. And the fantastic understanding um, of the government, I thought, was that it wasn't meant to be a separation line. It wasn't meant to be a declaration, here's where my country ends and this is where your country starts or where your country ends. It's meant to be a meeting point rather than a, a kind of a separation border. We have um, conference rooms, there are terraces to overlook the Black Sea. Actually, people can go quite close and also you know, use it, bathe there. Um, it's kind of a public space, if you like. And which other country can you imagine that sees a building like this as part of an opening process rather than a separation control system? Some images how you would experience it, how this country says hello to you or goodbye on the other hand. Um, here you see a section with the conference rooms and the terraces overlooking the Black Sea that you can rent. And of course it works night and day and night. Another project is a very small airport in Mestia, which is all the way up in the Caucasian Mountains. Um, it's developed into a tourism resort, um, beautiful uh, ski resort, uh, which has to be developed, but of course in a very kind of old um, historical cultural setting, which is Mestia that you see in, uh, in the background. It has all these old stone towers um, that make kind of the landmark of uh, this site. And the tower, of course, references partly these proportions of the old towers, but also introduces a new infrastructure, which is the small airport. That's maybe the only way you can get there, really, or you drive 10 hours by car up the street into the mountains. Another project in the same city is a small town hall that we've just finished, and also a police station um, in the very center of the city. <coughs> Two other projects in Gori are rest stops along the new highway. And the highway is also the first highway they're building right now to run from east to west. Uh, Georgia is a transit country, um, also with other you know, agricultural uh, qualities and, and economic forces but the transit is a key point in the economy there. And so it's also important to understand that the rest stops are not only kind of service stations along the highway, but they also are activators um, in their locality. Um, they would be built sometimes in areas where there is no highway yet, but they would bring a supermarket, they would bring a cultural room where they can show arts and crafts, they would provide a roof for a local farmer's market, et cetera. So they really work as kind of um, first indicators of a change of the country. And uh, when we were there for the opening, I think the biggest honor was that here in Gori, um, that's actually the town where Stalin was born, um, people already applied for having their, festi uh, their festivities after their wedding ceremony in the rest stop. So you can imagine the urge for something new and some kind of other forms of spaces for um, the population there. And the last one I want to show you from Georgia is in La Sica. La Sica is an urban planning scheme for a new town for 500,000 people on the Black Sea coast, from scratch, basically. Um, here you see what's happened so far. It's a boulevard. It's a small um, town hall in the end, and a pier with a structure, a sculpture that we just 
finished, or is actually going to be finished in the next couple of weeks. It's a splash, a kind of a frozen splash in the sea um, that kind of indicates is a marker for this new development to come. And here you see how we translated this into an object that is an identifier for um, this new development to come. Just some pictures on the construction phase. Um, and this is a photo we just got two weeks ago from um, the local construction people. We might see if it really works as an indicator for a new city because the new uh, elected government gave up the idea of building a new town there. So it might just sit there and rust along. Um, what happens otherwise with structures like this in a very dense populated part is our project in Seville. And this is maybe what we learned also from um, our Berlin experience, that there is a desire to really use public space and open air space as something to experience a communal um, discourse, a communal feel. And uh, in a way, Seville had a similar problem that, of course, you know, people are on the street in Spain all the time, and the weather and the atmosphere helps you um, more than the Berlin grayness um, six months of the year. But here, it also was an area in the city which was a little bit um, forgotten. It's, although very central, it's the very center of the medieval town center. Um, but it was kind of given up a couple of years ago, <coughs> which I'll show you in a second. Here you see some aerial views of Metropole Parasol in the very center. Another view closer. And it was important in the competition that we won in 2004 that the site somehow becomes re-evaluated as a new heart for the city of Seville. It sits in the very center, as I mentioned before. It was a hole for the last 30 years. It was kind of a non-place for the last 30 years. And the competition asked to find a way to keep this window into the history of Seville, which are Roman ruins and found you know, mosaics and so forth, to introduce the market again, which was there before but also think about what is kind of an urban space in the 21st century. This was the market in the 20, um, in the 50, until the 50s and 70s, which was then taken down. Um, this is how it looked like. It was really run down and became dangerous. I think nowadays we would try to save it, but in the 70s, the car was more important um, to introduce to the city, and this was the parking lot for about 20 to 30 years. When we worked on the competition, I had a couple of ideas in mind how a uh, kind of a public space would work, not as a frame as you would have it in Plaza Mayors or uh, Plaza Reals, but with objects activated as magnets or with magnets um, that are certain institutions. And Plaza de la Encarnacion was always an institution. It was never really a square. There was a cloister before, it got bigger, the cloister got bigger, um, they ripped out more fabric, then it became the market. And then when the market was taken down, we felt that we also had to introduce, again, some kind of object that is the center of, or is the main point of this public space. So we looked at some examples, and I live very close to the Gedächtniskirche, and I really like it as this extremely beautiful ensemble, um, kind of a set of objects, which constantly attracts different forms of activities, then it's empty again, then there's something else happening. So it's a, a fluctuation, a pulse that the city um, kind of needs and the city celebrates. And sometimes it's really ugly, it's like, you know, they have these ice skate rings and these jumping air, I don't know, castles. And then it's a really beautiful moment where you have maybe a Christmas market or even um, kind of a street performance um, happening there. Similar also the square in Krakow where you have the market hall in the center and this tower, and they become kind of these accumulators um, of uh, different activities uh, and performances on the street. And even this plaza here in Mexico City with this huge flag um, has a certain programmatic idea where you sit there or stand there when you have to wait um, and escape the sun. <laughs> Metropole Parasol also is all about shadow. It's about creating a climate where you can um, enjoy the outside uh, in a city that's a lot um, heated uh, 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 during the year. And Shadow also as a kind of a design tool or as, a, as an animator of the space was important. So this is at one point of the day and then it looks completely different at some other time of the day. When you look at it from the sky, this is a Bing map, you hardly see it. 
Um, it becomes somehow invisible. And there are some sketches how we developed it. So the roof was really the guiding point, and then we had to bring down the loads at very selected parts into the foundations to really um, make it, allow it actually even to be built because there were some protected parts we couldn't um, touch. And we tested some different programs. The cloud or this kind of mushroom structure was always there. And we also tried to find out why is this working so well? Um, we haven't really been there for the competition. It was a um, uh, kind of anonymous competition in the first phase. And then they selected 10 projects. And then we had to all present to each other and um, be kind of in a dialogue also with the public. But in the first phase, it was more of a remote um, uh, kind of uh, intervention. But then in the second phase, we were going back and looked at why it made so much sense. And so he, here you see trees from a neighboring plaza, very similar in the sculptural quality. This is a beautiful stone roof of the cathedral, this kind of undulated flying carpet of stone, which was another reference. And of course, the inside of um, the Gothic cathedral, the structure that becomes the space defining element. The layers are archaeology museum, food market, elevated plaza, and then the roof to create shadow with a restaurant and a skywalk. The design process somehow worked the other way around, from top to bottom. But it shows that there is an idea of a public space that more than just you know, an untouched public space. It's a different uh, kind of combination of programs, not unproblematic in terms of public and private um, partnership as this project was developed. Um, but it gives you different pockets of activities and different kind of neighborhoods to the square, which are all important in its daily life. Here is some view from the archaeology museum. These are the sections. Um, it's about 100 meter long, 180 meters long, 75 meters wide, and 30 meters high. It was all built in, in a timber construction, <coughs> which uh, we kind of developed a new from the dining hall I showed you earlier, this green kind of skeleton structure. But it's not really important in terms of how it works now in dialogue with the city. And I think in this dialogue between the existing old fabric of Seville and this um, new sculptural um, space celebrated by the citizens really makes the quality um, of this project. There was, of course, criticism, um, mostly from the Catholic, religious, conservative group of um, civilians. But last year, kind of the year after it opened, this was the cover of the Semana Santa, which is the religious week before Easter, um, where they have all the program and uh, kind of the activities described. And it appeared to be on the cover. So maybe there's also some shift of understanding and appreciation of this project in their everyday kind of ritual or annual ritual of the city. You see it here, the city shuts down, they have these processions, there's a different kind of music in the city, there's kind of this breath of people carrying these really heavy structures. Um, there's a celebration of a different kind of uh, history of the city. But there's also, of course, a website and a Facebook page, so it's managed well, you know, which needs to be done. It appeared already in a couple of music videos. This is a very cheesy Latino pop. It also works for hip hop, supposedly. Um, and another cheesy one is in the elevator. It also worked well for the Euro games last year. This is, um, I think, one of the final game shots where the people really choose that place as the place to celebrate the country or their soccer players. It also was the site for uh, action movie. This is a shooting that happened on Plaza de la Encarnacion. And it was the celebration point for Gay Pride or the Cartoon Festival. Um, so you see transformations of this project already happen into different forms of creative response. And it was also the site for Revolución, the Indignados, who choose 
Metropole Parasol as their site to discuss about the future of their society, of the future of Spain, of the future um, of their city. And again, it really works for all kinds of different appropriations, different discussions about the future of our society. So our work not really is about answers. It's about trying to find out if our projects can open up questions um, about what could, should, or would be a possible future for our cities. And this project, I think, is one that poses that question quite well. Thank you very much. get Rem in? I see him. <laughs> Can we make him a bit bigger? Okay. Can you say something? We make sure we hear you. Uh, do you want me to say something? We would love you to we would love you to uh, respond to these three presentations. Hi, hi. Uh, well, I think Let's it would need uh, a mind more elastic than mine to kind of really respond to these uh, three um, presentations. Uh, I really can't. Uh, maybe the only thing I can do is to kind of really address uh, slightly the issue of uh, capital city uh, missed opportunity. Um, and I made some kind of very short points and that uh, I will communicate it and that will be it. I think that very few people in America now can imagine the uh, incredible aura that Berlin built uh, over the 20th century. Um, kind of first by inventing uh, modernity, then by inventing enormity, uh, then of course uh, through the war accumulating enormous guilt and then uh, in the form of the wall uh, to create uh, an exceptional uniqueness that no other city uh, has ever achieved. And uh, although the aura was maybe a negative aura, I think it was nevertheless very strong and perhaps the kind of real genius of Ungers is to really see that aura and to take it uh, in his hands and to declare Berlin a kind of laboratory and that is uh, really, in, in that sense, uh, a kind of stroke of genius that uh, established uh, Berlin as a kind of very unique situation. Now, if you look at 90, uh, 1989, the wall fell. And I think that uh, in a certain way, you have to kind of read the fall of the wall as the beginning of uh, Berlin's uh, loss of aura. Uh, it lost its uniqueness um, uh, because it was became a city almost like uh, any other. But I think very few people in America right now uh, can imagine is the extent to which 89 was kind of almost a panic. Uh, it really was as if America would discover that the Midwest uh, in its entirety had been stuck into the 19th uh, century and uh, as if America would decide that uh, it would uh, undo, have to undo that inequality uh, in less than 10 years. The, the sheer effort of the reunification is kind of really in, in current political uh, precedent uh, almost uh, unimaginable. And it is no uh, surprise in a way that uh, Berlin had kind of very little opportunity to, within that panic, also to seriously consider or to carefully consider uh, what the status of uh, capital would mean for Berlin. Um, you will later hear a presentation by Stimman. Uh, he has an interesting name. It means uh, voice man. Uh, he is very convinced. Uh, it was he who kind of created the um, image of the capital Berlin uh, and, and who, who adopted the model or imposed the model of 
uh, the uh, ideal uh, historical city. Um, and I think that what he didn't realize and what very few realized is that there was a kind of a coincidence between the ideal increment of his ideal city and the ideal increment of the market economy, which of course by 89, uh, the end of Thatcher's reign and uh, 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 end of Reagan's reign was at its uh, most intense. So I think that the best and the most kind of productive way of looking at perhaps this whole situation is not to uh, keep bemoaning kind of lost opportunities or to uh, uh, think that uh, there was a theoretical Berlin that could have existed and that would have been kind of infinitely more uh, kind of rich and, and unusual than the current one. I think uh, what has been uh, almost inevitable, uh, partly through the distraction and partly through the kind of historical forces of the market economy is that kind of Berlin, Berlin uh, ultimately lost its aura uh, and became a city like uh, any other. And I think that is the kind of story that uh, uh, we have been hearing without perhaps making it explicit and that you will be hearing in the future. Thank you. Shall we have a little conversation among our um, participants? Oh, it's late. Peter is saying it's late, and he and we have to have another panel. Okay, so if we can have the lights, uh, and uh, may maybe we need to, do we need a break, or can we go right into it? Five minute break, a bio break. Uh, we will resume at a quarter of four.